No? All right. So I guess it's a good thing that I um, consulted Mary Webster. <laughs> All right. So um, I should also say, as a preparatory remark, that this is going to be somewhat polemical. Um, there are going to be parts of this presentation that you won't agree with, specifically my viewpoint on marriage. Um, but the material on the artists is going to be very, very calmly delivered, perfectly uh, mm -hmm. appropriately argued, and we can talk about that instead of marriage. So um, I looked at Merriam-Webster's definition of ritual, and uh, in addition to their definition, they provided examples of usages of the term. Uh, the priest will perform the ritual. He was buried simply without ceremony or ritual. The daily ritual of preparing breakfast and his day-to-day -day life is based on ritual. <laughs> All of that is actually ritual. So. <laughs> uh, what I found interesting about these four examples was that they did very specific work. And you know, any kind of uh, public presentation, any kind of publication, is actually going to be doing work. Um, there's a Canadian dictionary which defines a uh, bicycle. And it gives you a concrete example of someone from Toronto taking their bicycle to a party instead of driving. And it is so classically Torontonian in attitude that it is completely warped. No one would ever say that that was an objective definition of a bicycle in a Canadian context. Anyway, here we have them. And what I wanted to say was the work that these examples do is, first of all, establish the religious origin of ritual. It's something which is done by a vested leader with a line on God or a God or gods. Then it suggests that you can actually do without that religious ritual performed by the priest, but you're still going to be following a social ritual of burial, as opposed to, say, leaving the corpse out for the crows to eat it. Right? So you're still following that specific Ritual. So you eliminate the sacred ritual, but you've still got the secular ritual. And um, then the third definition establishes ritual as something which is not sacred, but secular and really quite banal. Um, but it doesn't mention here who is doing the ritual. And in most cases, the preparation of breakfast is done by women. So they're slipping something in here and not addressing the gender context. And then finally, this statement, his day-to-day -day life is based on ritual. This is the one that's a little more mysterious than the others, because we don't really know what tone of voice that particular statement is being delivered with. So it seems to be that this guy doesn't realize that his day-to-day -day life is based on ritual, and perhaps he needs to keep it going. Perhaps he is too ritualistic in his actions. This could be an episode of Borders, for instance. Um, but there's uh, a lot of people, I think, who would resist the claim that day-to-day -day life is based on ritual, if in fact this is supposed to be a general claim. And that's precisely because of the association of ritual with organized religion and with superstition. So a lot of rituals have those uh, negative associations. Now this is in a North American context. So how is it that a writer or ritual can be sacred or secular? How is it that it can be both? Because in either context, it's a matter of following rules invested with magical, supposedly transformative significance. Okay? So whether the context is religious or secular, the idea is that there's something magical about the ritual, and you are somehow transformed through it. And when we call going to Starbucks a ritual, uh, in a way we're talking about the fact that we do it every day, but we also feel transformed. And I, I'm looking at your cup of coffee and I want to uh, kill you for it, but that's the cup of coffee. Um, I will be transformed later on by my Starbucks. So this magical significance diverts us from the fact that at heart, ritual is a matter of submission to some form of higher power. Whether that higher power is nature, a god, or social standards. Uh, if we engage in a ritual, we're promising or proving that we are loyal. 
And we are doing this by assuming a prescribed role in the ritual. And that role is sometimes the role of the community and the society, say, of Americans uh, in a nation as part of a religion. Sometimes these roles are exalted, and sometimes they're quite lowly. And I think most of us feel very comfortable with rituals that afford us a middle ground between the high and the low, as long as those rituals also give somebody an exalted role, so that we know we've got something that we can aim for. We wouldn't want to do rituals in which everybody um, gets to be a joke shop uh, and do the work that nobody else wants to do. So if we say that his day-to-day -day life is based on ritual, um, we're actually saying something that isn't banal, that needs to be acknowledged probably more often as a political truth, not just a fact. Um, it's certainly not just a potted anthropological observation that we would toss out at a party, nor is it a pop psychological observation. And the idea that our life is run by ritual is a political fact. So um, I want to look briefly at um, Marriage, um, it is one of our most important rituals in the Western world. It has a very long history. Uh, ownership of the woman is transferred through marriage from her father to her husband. Uh, this is why women were considered property or chattel well into the 19th century, um, why they could not divorce their husbands nor vote. Uh, you have to be a person to vote. That is the legal requirement, and women were not classified as persons, but as property. Even if women have greater rights, in the present day, the symbolic elements of the ritual ceremony are perpetuated. The ring symbolizes bondage uh, and not in a good way. And the tossing of hay symbolizes the declaration of the virgin. Many, many virgins are married in this culture. Else. So marriage is itself a pageant of inequality, expressed in everything from the gender differentiated edifice to the cost, which is prohibitive for an awful lot of people and uh, obscene for people who can imagine that money being put to you know, better uses, like meeting the basic needs of others. So marriage in a capitalist world is the business of outfitting people with kitchen gadgets. And in the USA, it somehow also wins participants 1,009 additional rights and privileges. Now, these rights seem to mostly have to do with keeping the money that one earns, in other words, paying lower taxes, um, but also with things like uh, health care, health care that could be extended to your partner, as long as that partner is a man or a woman and you're in a heterosexual marriage, um, things like uh, grief leave, or maternity leave. Those are not currently available to people who are not male to female married. So I would say that uh, marriage has never been about equality. And while I support the fight for gay marriage rights, I personally look forward to the day when we're fighting to abolish marriage completely as the standard by which we judge people in this culture. All right, so ritual and contemporary art is typically associated with performance art. Today I want to talk about video, however. And um, what performance art uh, that gives you a kind of extreme ritual does is show the artist's loyalty to art with a capital A. If you are willing to get shot in the arm, that means you are an artist. And the people who are there witnessing are art viewers. Right? This is the extreme. This is the standard. So um, Faith Wilding performed uh, what she called waiting. Um, this was a ritual performance. She sat on a stage, slumped over, and she named all of the things that women wait for in their lives. And it went on for a very long time, um, waiting for the phone to ring, for instance, waiting to get your period, waiting, 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 always waiting. Um, there was no blood. She was not shot. Um, maybe she was on the bed, but that's not the kind of blood that you want to see. Or I'm sorry. I like to think of these ritual performances as an opportunity to test social relationships between the artist and the audience, which is put in a very uncomfortable position, being asked to either watch someone get shot or intervene and therefore ruin the art and ruin it for everybody else. Um, what I find is that when I give that lecture to students, they nod 
while <laughs> giving the lecture. But then they go home and they revert to the default position, which is this art is great because of the psychological test that the artist must undergo. So it always ends up being a proof of individuality and a proof of the artist's devotion to his or her art. And there are women who have done extreme performances. Marina Abramovich is an example. So in terms of um, videos, I want to talk about Matthew Barney, first of all, very briefly. He's definitely a proponent of the return to ritual in contemporary art. Um, in his pre-master series of five films, the rituals are typical, bordering on trite. Um, each one of them casts Barney, the artist, in the role of the hero, who must go out and perform a certain task, fulfill a quest, defeat an enemy. Um, uh, here, Barney poses in his uh, Scottish-inspired costume, and the idea is that he's going to hurl that object in the way that some Scotsmen hurl tree trunks. Does anyone know what that's called? Um, but you've seen them do this. Yeah, all right, so. That is his version on that test of strength, that proof of his prowess. Um, in this particular version of Premaster in number three, he ultimately has to go head to head with Richard Serra, who is obviously a very famous artist, well established, um, and he is the master in this particular scenario. And Barney has to test himself against that master. Now, once he can demonstrate his manhood, once he can win his gender identity as something which is uh, securely male, and that is the um, quest of the entire series. He can then have a bride. He can then marry. Right? It's always the woman who is the prize for passing the test. Now, um, I would say that if you see him here with uh, Amy Mullins, it doesn't look like a marriage made in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, these people are missing parts. Certainly, he hasn't got his teeth. She hasn't got her lower legs. She's actually uh, an, an athlete, but her lower legs are prosthetic. Um, at another point in this film, she also plays a foe. She plays a leopard that he has to uh, deal with. So she plays more than one role here. So like I said, not a marriage made in heaven, but still a marriage in the past. Uh, Drawing Restraint 9 uh, was made immediately after Barney finished the Master series. And here we have two unbearable scenes of carefully observed rituals. Um, in one, uh, Bjork, who you see on the right there, who is Barney's partner in real life, performs the Japanese tea ceremony. Um, she's serving Barney and uh, an elder, an older Japanese man. Uh, and this goes on forever. And the number of times she has to open and close the sliding door um, and do it in three stages is enough to make anyone who wants to go by uh, another bucket. <laughs> The other ritual uh, doesn't take as long, and, and the uh, actions in it are not as minute. Um, that ritual is the final consummation of the love that develops between these two characters. And in that ritual, they hack each other's lower halves to pieces. Um, I should say that what you see under the ice is their lower bodies, which are in the shape of whales, um, the lower half of whales. So it seems to be um, an anti wailing message, although Barney did have to actually hire the Nissan Maru, which is the lead whaling ship in the Japanese fleet, in order to deliver that message. So there's a little bit of a catch-22 there. Um, but at the very least, it um, puts what I might call a negative spin on achieving the heterosexual relationship, which really all you're doing is cutting the partner. All right, well, now we can move on from Matthew Barney to where mm -hmm. Anne Streamside May follows. Um, as a French artist who has a lot of um, European buddies, Pierre Ouf uh, is not at all interested in couples and marriage. It is a very, very strange phenomenon. Um, and I have to say, actually, as someone from Canada that you don't get those 1,009 extra rights in the year. You may get three or four. Um, and I've never seen people marry in Canada at the same rate as they do here. So there has to be a connection um, between those advantages. All right, so um, 
Um, Lee is not interested in uh, proof of manhood and marriage. The rituals that appear in his works and in the works of his friends that have been classified under this aesthetic relations category um, are often celebrated by very lazy art critics who think that this is a great thing for artists to create temporary communities engaged in celebration. And why not? That sounds fabulous. You get to have a party, and your commitment to a community only lasts for that hour. So it's not a big deal. You get to escape at the end, and that's key here. Um, and one of the reasons why Ud likes to work in video is because of the time factor there. He likes the fact that this is a time-based movie. Um, so his parties are time-based, and the videos are also time-based. So stream side day follies could be mistaken for a documentary of a celebration held by the residents of a new Hudson Valley subdivision called Streamside. Um, the inhabitants of this new subdivision were lured there because they were uh, enticed by the promise of living in close proximity to nature. So they leave the city and they come here to be closer to the animals. Oop opens this film with a very, very simple parallel. We see a little blonde girl who's packing up to make the move to Streamside, and we also see a little deer a fawn, in fact, um, who enters a new prefab home where he cannot find the stream that he used to call it at. Right? In other words, his home is gone because the little brown girl's home has been built. The video offers no critique of this incursion on the animal's territory. This is distinctly French. All right? There is no critique. In French films, people do crazy things, often in the name of love, and there is no judgment. And similarly, we get no judgment from the <coughs> It's not clear to me whether or not he expects his audience to be um, outraged by the developers and the inhabitants who have decided to come here um, and displace the deer, um, or if he wants us to be laughing with him at how sly he is in making but not making that particular scene. So I'm going to play a clip of the video uh, it's more important, really, to listen to what Oob is saying, although I do have it there on the screen for you. Um, and what you'll see in the images here is just images from um, the video that have been edited uh, differently. So it's not the actual stream side data. Well. Oh, yeah. from the parade to the concert to the food to the mayor uh, in a girl's speech to the kids playing to everything. Just being up there. It's, it's a script. It's a recipe. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a score. This score can be played again next year at the same time on October 11. Just take this sheet of paper and say parade and then you say unpack and the day and forward. For me, the most important thing is this idea that you will set up this performance because it's in a loop of the year and you will just come back and come back and come back. That's why it interests me to produce a time, the duration that will just come back in time. I'm building a kind of mythology. Form of a party which we call celebration one time a year. You have a score and then you have an interpretation. Um, I think that uh, Oud is definitely recalling 
um, both the situationists, who had a theory that you could somehow disrupt and transform society by setting up a situation that was unusual and letting it play out. Of course, this situation is not unusual. Uh, he's also thinking about uh, Fluxus and about the lesson that they took from John Cage, which was to create a very simple score and then let the art unroll in the real. Um, in theory, instead of scripting this film for performers, as Barney does, um, Boog sets up a scenario and he sees what happens when people are assigned roles and then placed into a specific setting and then in theory allowed to do exactly what they want. Um, this seems like an, a model of openness and that kind of openness has been extremely popular in the art world. In practice, however, what occurred on October 11th is uh, something the viewers do not get to witness in this particular video, because uh, the film is not a documentary, and, and Boo readily admits that. And this is not just a matter of the style he uses, the fact that it's heavily edited, the fact that he obviously had to get that gear to walk into that house and look lost, um, but also because he believes that um, experience is never unmediated at this point in history. And this is the fallout from the turn to the postmodern. So according to Ood, there's no longer any distinction between an event and its representation. Those two things cannot be separated. So no distinction between an event and its representation. There's nothing to be represented. Right? There's no event to be documented, because the event itself is a representation. Um, and when we say representation, this is pretty simple here. People ritually celebrate community according to a social script. So there's one form of representation. Um, and they also do this by mimicking the representations that they see on TV and in the media. That's how we learn how we're supposed to behave. So one of the problems with this situation, um, and it's one that Sue <coughs> only brings up in passing, is that uh, we forget history because our representations are not one of the things he mentions is that the Halloween ritual of going door to door is based in the door to door begging on the part of Irish children during the potato famine. And you don't need to be Sinead O'Connor to be suspicious about why that particular famine occurred, somehow naturally. Um, so if Halloween is a North American phenomenon, it's because that famine touched off the wave of emigration to the United States, or at least part of um, the reasons behind. So my question is, is there nevertheless potential value in ritual activity? And by now, you should be expecting me to say, absolutely not. Um, let's, let's find out what, what Boog thinks instead of what I think. Uh, here's another citation from him. The celebration is supposed to be something that we have in common, that we share, and that we celebrate because of this common basis. It is like a monument. But unlike a monument, an event can be renegotiated each time it is represented, although this is rarely the case. So there's potential here for making different representations. It's worthwhile to do the ritual again because it's possible to do it differently, although, as he says, this is rarely accomplished. So, uh, for instance, the next time we have Halloween, we could bring the potato famine back into focus, although Maybe we just want to look at skeletons and associate that with the fact that uh, people were starving. Um, it's not a leap. Uh, we could, for example, not have a parade which is led by a police car. <laughs> that always sends the wrong message if you're looking to celebrate. And uh, you could pay. You give up the parade and you say the truth instead. Or become an advocate against human expropriation of animals. I don't think um, Boog really cares what you do. Um, but he puts you in the situation of imagining that you need to decide. So, um, as George Baker writes of the opportunity that Boog gives us, quote, in inventing the rules of a game, a scenario for a situation, the artist creates something that can locally affect a reality. So that is potential. There can be a local effect. So, um, I want to finish by looking at Ud's most recent, recently exhibited work, which is the 
host to the cloud. And I did spend some time um, finding out about cloud hosting. I'm going to assume you guys are super heavy and you know all about that and you can tease that kind of little metaphor for yourself. Okay, I wrote it down. You can ask me after. Mm -hmm. So things get much more complicated in this most recent video, um, which I saw, which is now playing in New York City at the Marion Goodman Gallery. So you can go and see it for yourself. It is set in the Museum of Popular Arts and Traditions, which is apparently located at the end of an old amusement park. Um, it has a, a website, which is uh, rather pathetic. And I think that website is designed to prove its downward mobility. Nobody's going to this amusement park. Nobody's going to this museum. And it, the idea is that it's because it's devoted to popular arts and traditions. And you can just imagine how many Apple dolls and old computers they've got jammed into their storerooms. So on three occasions, uh, we've had people come to the museum after hours and having been assigned roles in some scenarios, these people proceeded to celebrate together. And these occasions were Valentine's Day, Halloween, and May Day. Um, in Europe, May Day is Labor Day. Um, they have parades instead of barbecues. So on Labor Day, you celebrate your uh, collective solidarity of laborers. You don't say, oh my god, the summer's almost over. I will spend the weekend flying over. So I've chosen these stills just to give you a taste of what goes on in the film. Um, we have people wandering around dressed in these uh, lab coats, which I assume are supposed to be the coats that technicians in the museum would usually wear. Um, but they're carving pumpkins instead of doing the work of, say, a conservationist. There's a sequence um, which excerpts from the transcript of the trial of four members of Action Direct, which was a French terrorist group. Um, this woman sees a supermodel and uh, gets to witness that supermodel posing for a camera, and then after the model has thrown off all of her clothing and makeup and walked away, um, this woman dresses in that clothing and makeup and then turns herself in. Characters from cartoons appear as characters in the film. Uh, there's a lot of hay made out of the uh, silly rabbit tricks of our kids, including people pulling rabbit sack hats. Um, these masks are fabricated in the workshop, and then people wear them. Uh, you can see them in this sequence, and also in this sequence, which comes towards the end of the film. And the film does end with an orgy. Um, these people are on their way to the orgy, which takes place in the basement. Um, this is a ritual involving the supermodel uh, who is there arrested um, during that ritual. Uh, the Marion Goodman exhibition includes three aquariums, and these are meant to illustrate Boo's technique for these celebrations. Uh, he gathers fish and he puts them in a tank, and then he lets what happen, lets what happens happen. Um, I have to say, having seen the aquarium, that um, Booth chose this particular film because of its star quality by this particular fish. And this fish was indeed incredibly friendly and charming. So he's a good casting director, if nothing else. Um, most of the other things in the tank, the other creatures in the tank, are invertebrates or really incredibly ugly to the point of making you sort of feel like you're on a strange, strange planet as opposed to a human in control of absolutely everything. Um, it's an imperfect parallel, and I'm going to suggest that's partly because fish do not impersonate Michael Jackson and do the dance from Thriller. Um, and even if they did, they probably wouldn't agree to have that filmed as part of an art project. Uh, fish don't form terrorist cells, to my knowledge. Um, as a liberal European, uh, Booth is more patient with terrorism than Americans are, and specifically with the ideas put forth by members of Action Direct. Um, Action Direct argued that in any kind of revolution, a um, stage of armed struggle is necessary. Um, they did bank robberies, supposedly on the Robin Hood principle of redistribution of wealth, but they also assassinated two men. Um, one was a leading French arms dealer, and another man, his crime against society is not clear. It's possible because he was once the head of Renault, um, 
a major French corporation, but it's not clear to me from what I've looked at um, what it was he was really held responsible for. So the trial transcript um, provides a script for two scenes in Post and Cloud. And in the first one, actors portraying members of Action Direct state that they refuse to have a lawyer involved because they reject the legitimacy of the court and the process of representation by a lawyer. They also reject the trial itself as spectacle rather than justice. And that is an argument which dates back at least the 1960s to Guy Debord, as some of my former students will recall. In the second scene, the actors playing the judges read the same statement. And the fact is that it makes as much sense coming from their perspective as it does coming from members of action and direct. So once again, we're left with a kind of stalemate. Right? We're left with something which doesn't give us any kind of firm ethical guideline. It's possible that what Wu wants us to take away from this is that ritual doesn't work for people who are in power. It doesn't work for people who don't have power, but presumably it doesn't work for those who have power either. Um, I also want to point out that fish don't care about what happens in the museum. Um, but Oof does, and many of these relational aesthetics artists are really dedicated to finding a way to make the museum work again, to invigorate it, to re-enliven it. And um, they do this primarily by making it strange. And that is a very, very old avant-garde technique. Finally, fish don't have orgies. Um, maybe they do. Um, but I'm doing, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting conflicting information, so we'll just move on very quickly. Um, if they did, they probably wouldn't focus on heterosexual penetration. I'm just guessing. Um, Oog's film asks us to believe the participants who are becoming a community at a party uh, decided to go to the basement for a group work. Um, it's possible they went to the basement to escape the nudity of the party. Now, that was Kate Bush's original version of Wuthering Heights played backwards. So the original version itself is hard to listen to for a lot of people played backwards. <laughs> Although I have to say that it was hearing that music that attracted me to the film. So, uh, you know, it's, it's supposed to be torture, and yet it can also be alluring. Um, all of these references to popular culture draw us in. Um, Nouvelle topless girls in French films, it, it's pretty much part of the course. Uh, I didn't really have a problem with that. Um, the, the inevitability of work on community turning to group sex. <laughs> you can sort of see how this could happen. Uh, I wasn't that surprised, but I was surprised that there had to be one shot of heterosexual penetration. Uh, and it was a close-up, not a terribly shame on close-up, but you know, it was a close-up. And, um, you know, there's two things that are accomplished with this. One, it tells us just how far this um, supposedly spontaneous orgy went. But it also tells us that this is clearly not documentary. Um, and his motivations for that are um, unclear. Because most of the time, he wants us to be able to suspend our disbelief and accept his films as both fiction and documentary at the same time. That's all I have to say.